Welcome back to Disciplology, a podcast where we talk about all things discipleship. Last week, we spent some time in mental health with Evan, and it was such a good conversation that we split it into two halves. And so if you missed last week, I'd really love for you to go back and listen to that, and then this is where we're going to pick it up today. What seems to be happening, which is great, is that the stigma, though, you talk about the, the, the terms depression, anxiety, and for a long time, there's been a stigma in the church, especially about admitting that Good. you have yep. any of those. Um, and that seems to be going away a little bit. It seems to be more uh, okay mm -hmm. to admit that you have that. And I think that that's a good thing. Yeah, I think that like Agreed. 2020 has brought a lot of that out. Yeah. You know, so COVID has allowed us to talk about this. It has, yeah. And then something like Rick Warren with their son that went through. Right. There's uh, been high profile. High profile people that say, wait, we need to talk about this as, as a church. And, and that's what I love that you guys are doing at Reboot is you're giving resources now mm. to churches to be able to talk through trauma mm -hmm. with people in groups. So just talk about what you guys are doing right now with, with what, how you're preparing churches. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I would say on that last point, just how tragic that it took high profile That's right. suicides for us to actually talk about it. Yep. Um, and, you know, number two though, with that is I also hear a lot of pastors, preachers saying, you know, well, you know, we're all broken and that's the language that they use. Um, and I would just challenge if you're a person in ministry and you've bought into this idea that all of us are broken, I would argue that all of us are wounded. There's a difference in my mind between brokenness and woundedness, brokenness, you know, like woundedness wounds can heal if proper steps are taken. Brokenness is sort of a state. And I don't think God calls us to be people who are permanently broken. Mm. I think he calls us people to be who were wounded and then have scars and then use those scars as evidence mm -hmm. of what he did in our mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes when we're broken, what happens is we get very inward focused and we miss out on an opportunity to help other people because we're in constant fractured mode, right? Um, and so what Reboot's doing now is we're really bringing people together to create really resilient, healthy communities. And so we have a small group curriculum. Um, you can go to RebootRecovery.com and read all about this, obviously, but small group curriculum, it's peer led. It's a great place for prayer teams or other small group leaders or pastors to kind of plug people who have gone through difficult experiences into. Um, it's a 12 week long course. We have hundreds and hundreds of them going on around the country right now. So it's not like you'd be the first person to ever try it. It's been tested. We've been around for a decade, had thousands of people go through no big problems or else we would have shut it down. Uh, lots of evidence showing that it works. But then the other thing we're doing is we're also doing a training where churches are bringing us in for workshops and having us train their small group leaders, train their lay leaders, train their, um, uh, their prayer team members on how do you have difficult conversations with someone who's gone through something that result in productive, helpful conversations. Um, how do you set good boundaries? How do you, you know, understand who has what responsibilities for those relationships. And we find that's been lately, that's like the soup du jour. Just a lot of people are really wanting us to help with that because every small group leader is feeling like the first responder on the scene. Yes. And that's an overwhelming feeling when you're like, I just wanted to teach you the book of James. I don't want to talk about. <laughs> We're going to talk a surface stuff. Right. I really right, want right. to go that. Like, I wanted to read the passage and be like, so what do you guys think of that scripture? Like that was my plan for yeah, the night. Right. Um, and now you want to talk to me about, you know, how you have been abused in a relationship. You know, like I'm, that's intense, you know? Yeah. So that's good. How long, uh, you said it was a 12 week program, but how long is this, uh, recovery usually? Well, or is it ongoing forever? You're yeah. always going to be in it. Yeah. I would argue that I would argue that there's certain experiences. I mean, there's three types of trauma. There's acute, there's complex and there's chronic. I'm not going to get into all the details, but chronic trauma is basically, I've experienced one type of trauma over and over again. Domestic violence is a classic example. Sexual abuse is another classic example. Acute is usually a single event, bad car accident, something like that. And complex is basically a combination of a bunch of different types of traumas. Mm. If you've been through complex or chronic trauma, it's changed everything about you. It's changed how you process emotions. It's changed how you view relationships. It's changed. It's, it's a loss of your innocence. It's a loss of your ability to, to trust humanity. Right, I mean, those are, those are always going to shade the way you view the world. Um, not necessarily only bad though. I mean, there's, again, there can be purpose out of that. So we always say that the 12 week period is really an on ramp to a much deeper healing that can happen. Um, and so a lot of the people who go through our course also are in counseling, which we're a big fan of them doing that. Like, yes, please do that. Um, a lot of them have been afraid or they've had a bad experience with a counselor. They do this, but here's the thing about recovery is recovery just as what, this is what my wife always says is 
Um, trauma was your personal intersection with the brokenness of the world, but recovery is your personal intersection with the redemptive heart of God. Come on. And, and I think that, so recovery is when you start having that intersection with the redemptive heart of God and that process is just sanctifying, right? Over time, you're starting to realize like, wow, God, you actually love me. And just that beauty of that moment. And we find that there's people who, you know, in 12 weeks time, they are, they've locked root systems with other trees and they're able to start just growing and flourishing. There's other people who need to go through the course two or three times to let it really sink in and just tons of grace on both of those situations. You know, there's no time. I don't put a timeline on healing. I can't check that off my, my box. That would yeah. be hard for me. Um, I was listening to a, a rival podcast, and uh, <laughs> they, they said, um, you're all worth going to counseling. And the, the guest they had on said, no, no, no. We're all worth you going to counseling. So it was a little bit of a spin on, on the phrase, but it, it hit me differently in that how is my depression or anxiety or whatever mental health issue we want to put on, um, how is that affecting the people around me? What kind of impact am I having on their lives Mm. because of my refusal to go talk about it? Yeah, I would say what you've talked about, most people who actually have mental health issues, they have to have a pretty high level of self-awareness and actually uh-huh. a level of healing uh-huh. to even look for that. We actually always say the first sign that you've began to heal is that you realize somebody else other than yourself is hurting. Yeah. The second sign is you actually want to do something about it, right? Um, most people, when they're hurting, like if I was to cut r- myself really bad right now, like I'm not going to be super aware of anybody else's needs in the room because I'm bleeding out. Right. And it would be unnatural for me to do so. And sometimes I think in the Christian church, that's what we do. We send them to a three-day conference, and the next Sunday we expect them to be on stage telling their inspirational story to everybody right. helping. And they're like, yeah, they're still kind of bleeding out. Like, yeah, you you, you covered that. You got a bandage on there, but if you took yeah. that bandage off, it's going to tear right back open. Yeah. And so I'm always a little bit like hesitant with that kind of language. But what you're really talking about, too, is the secondary effects, right? There's lots of terms, secondary traumatic stress. There's lots of these things. But the the piece that I have found is when both parties do two things, one, when they both accept responsibility for the areas that they can take responsibility for, right? And they really define those. So they say, here's what I am willing to be responsible for. Here's what I cannot be. And when you have that difficult conversation and you do that, you avoid disappointment. I would say expectations, unspoken expectations are pre-planned disappointments. And so if we don't set the expectations, we're going to let each other down. So I would say that's the first thing is setting clear expectations. And then secondly, saying what I'm able to provide. And then the other person saying, I realize what you are not able to provide me. A lot of times when we're wounded, we're expecting, if I'm really badly cut, somehow subconsciously, I would expect everybody in here to be able to like stop the bleeding and give me stitches and make sure I don't bleed to death. Sure. But what if you guys literally didn't know how? Right? What if you physically or, or noticed that we, we didn't notice or didn't even notice I was bleeding? Right? And I think that a lot of times what happens is we who are wounded, we have expectations of others that like they physically aren't able to give us because they don't know how, mm. and that can really create a difficult relationship when we become bitter and angry. Like, why don't you understand what I'm going through? Do you not know the anxiety I feel with daily? All this kind of stuff. And when we're expecting a level of caregiving and a level of support that they don't have to give. And I see that burns out relationships. It ruins marriages. It ruins all kinds of things when, when there's not those difficult conversations happening. Um, so Evan, give me some advice. Um, I am a fixer. Mm-hmm. If I see an issue, I want to fix it. I want to change it. Yeah. Um, then you can come by my house. Yeah, yes. I'll give you a screwdriver. <laughs> Just go to town. Uh, and so my, my wife will uh, have an issue and I want to fix said issue and that that's not a good conversation starter like oh here's how you do that like that's that's super simple and you know <laughs> 15 so, minutes right or less like right fixed up and so uh <laughs> what advice do you have for a guy like me that you know what conversation starters do i really need to to dive into uh well yeah um i think this is um it's it's hard because none of us want to see someone else suffering Sure. And so there's an element. For, l- let me say this. If I'm hugging a cactus right now and complaining how bad it hurts, what advice are you going to tell me? Stop hugging the cactus. Let go of the Let cactus. Of the cactus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what I'm going to respond to you is I'm going to say, like, you don't know what it's like to hug a cactus. You've never hugged this kind of cactus. This is my cactus to deal yeah. with. And you're yeah. like, right, right. Like, I, I, I get what right. you're saying. 
and you need to stop hugging the cactus. Right. So sometimes I think those of us who have been wounded need to recognize that others have perceptions or perspectives of our situation that we actually need. Sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes what the other person needs to do is they need to lead with tons of grace and less truth. Grace basically says, I'm in your corner no matter what. Grace says, I accept you no matter what. Grace says, I'm not here to provide you any structure on how to change. I want you to know that whether you accept my opinions or not today, like I got your back, I'm in this with you. Yeah. Grace says, even if you never change and you're like this forever, I'll grace. be right beside you. Grace right? on grace. Right. And I think a lot of times we want to speed through grace and get to like the truth piece. Right. But truth without grace feels like judgment and condemnation. Mm. It feels like harsh and cold and maybe even sometimes a little bit um, condescending for us to feel it that way. And so I always advise people, if you're going to be going to a conversation with somebody who is actively wounded, meaning they are currently struggling, um, you can't go wrong if you leave with too much grace and just a little bit of truth. Like, And you can, you can couch that by saying, I'm in your corner no matter what. One of the things I'm wondering, though, is blank. And then you just drop a little little tiny pinch of, of truth in there. And then you do that over time. So I would say those things. The other thing is, I will say back to the conversation about we need to accept perceptions of people. I've learned slowly in my healing journey to accept when other people do give me a little bit of truth, assuming they do it with grace. I don't want truth without grace because those people, I don't need them in my, in my circle. <laughs> um, although I have plenty of them. Sure. I do have sure. plenty of them. I think we all do. Yeah. Um, which is great. There are some yeah. people whose spiritual gift is truth. Sure. And they need they like a, on Facebook. They, they need like a space. <laughs> they need like a spokesperson. They need like a Facebook filter yeah. um, that just enters a softening statement. But um, I'll say this is that, uh, wait a minute, I lost my train of thought. Hold on a second. As I, oh, oh, as they're, as they're giving me the grace and truth, I think I have to kind of step back for a minute and say, okay, is what they're telling me productive? And I've really tried to grow. I'm trying to grow in recognizing that not only do they see a different perspective, but that perspective may be a gift from God to help me through this period of time. Right. Maybe God's speaking to me through this person who truly does love me and care about me. Mm. And if I have that authentic relationship, I can see that person as a helper rather than a judge. Mm. And that's something that's really hard. I'm not saying it's easy. Um, and so it kind of takes both parties, I think, you know, um, but lots of grace. If you only give grace though, without any truth, that is called another word. That's called enablement. Mm. And we also don't want to do that. Right. And so um, sadly, I think churches, because they're afraid of talking about mental health, they tend to lean towards enablement. Mm. And then they get compassion fatigue, they get burnout, they call me. <laughs> Where can we find out more about you, more about your ministry? Yeah, rebootrecovery.com. They can find us on social uh, at Reboot Recovery, I guess, is our Twitter and our Facebook. You can tell I spend a lot of time on social media. Uh -huh. Big fan of social media. <laughs> um, uh, all of my followers, both of them, my mom and my dad and uh -huh. my wife, big uh -huh. fans. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, yeah, they can go to our website. I encourage them, if they're hurting or struggling, go to join a group, whether or not their church is hosting one. We offer them online. We offer them, you know, all kinds of other churches would love to have you as a guest. Um, but then if they want to lead one at their church, they can just click lead a group. And it pretty much walks them through exactly what they need to do. That's great. That's really great. Well, thank cool. you for being no, here. Thank you guys. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, I often will listen to podcasts at 2x speed, and I would highly recommend slowing this Slow podcast this down. down. Oh, man, this was this so good. You had so much information. And I, I talk really fast. I, I love it. In the north. I love it. My wife always says, like, Evan, this is too much. Like, you just need to... Today at lunch, we had a guest, a guy we were interviewing for a new position, and like three sentences in, she just put her hand on my leg, and I knew. I was like, I need to, I need to stop slow talking down. and slow, slow down. down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, thank you for being here, guys, and we will see you next week.